Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. But who is the person behind this rhyme and why? Guy Fawkes would go down in history as a terrorist and a plotter against his king and his parliament. But who was he really? And why did a young boy from York become the infamous plotter of his century? Born around 1570 in Stonegate, York, Guy was the second of four children. His father and mother were Edward Fawkes, a proctor and later an advocate of the consistory court at York, and his wife Edith Jackson. As far as can be discerned, his parents and his paternal grandparents were dutiful adherents of Protestantism. Edith's parents and family, by contrast, were recusant Catholics. Little is known of Guy's youth, except that when he was about eight years old, his father died. As was expected of the time period, his mother remarried, this time to Dennis Bainbridge of the village of Scotton, Harrogate, who was also a Catholic, although Guy was about 17 years old at this point. Now Guy was growing up in the household of someone Catholic, and he grew closer to his mother's Catholic family too. This would have probably been encouraged by his education at St. Peter's School in York, where at least one governor and the headmaster were Catholic. Many of those he would later plot with were fellow pupils. Whether the influence came from his school, his mother's relatives or even his stepfather, at some point Guy rejected the Church of England and became Catholic. When Guy left school, he was first employed by Anthony Brown, first Viscount Montague, who was also Catholic but didn't get on well with him. Guy was dismissed, but it wouldn't be long before he was employed by Anthony Maria Brown, second Viscount Montague, who succeeded his grandfather when he was 18. The LDS Genealogical Index claims Guy married a woman around this time called Maria Pullane and had a child with her but this is based on secondary sources and not parish records, so is likely not true. In October 1591, Guy sold up the small estate in Clifton that he had inherited from his father and decided to become a soldier. Now 21 years old, Guy travelled to Catholic Spain to fight for them against the new Dutch Republic, part of what would become known as the Eighty Years' War. In 1595, he went to France to fight for Spain, staying there until 1598 with the Peace of Vervan, a peace treaty between France and Spain. By all accounts, Guy was a brave and capable soldier, but by 1602, he had risen no higher than the rank of ensign, roughly equivalent to second lieutenant, although the following year he was recommended for captain. In 1603, he travelled again to the Spanish court in order to ask for military aid in a rebellion to help English Catholics. While he was politely received at Philip III's court, the Spanish monarch was reluctant to offer support. In the same year, Guy began using the Spanish version of his name, Guido. He would later denounce James I of England, who had become king that year, describing him as a heretic who wanted to drive all Catholics out of England. He also thought the union between England and Scotland wouldn't last very long. An old school friend and Jesuit priest, Oswald Tesimund, would describe Guy in glowing terms. As a patient and pleasant person who was devout, loyal to his friends, opposed to quarrels, but also highly skilled in matters of war. Unfortunately, it was this exact mix of qualities that would encourage certain people to seek him out in the spring of 1604. Robert Catesby was the leader of a small group of English Catholics who had a treasonous plot to assassinate James I and replace him with his eldest and only surviving daughter, Princess Elizabeth Stuart as a Catholic monarch. She was nine years old at the time, but was chosen as it was believed her elder brother Prince Henry would probably die alongside his father 
and her two younger siblings were too, well, young. It was planned Elizabeth would be a puppet queen, brought up as a Catholic and later married to a Catholic groom. The information we have about the plot comes mostly from the confessions of Fawkes himself and his fellow conspirator Thomas Winter. Guy and Thomas had met early in 1604 in Ostend in Belgium. Winter had been sent to feel out Spanish support for after Princess Elizabeth became Queen. Just as Guy had discovered, the Spanish were reluctant to help, instead keeping out of it. Guy and Thomas travelled together to London, meeting with Catesby in his lodgings there in April. On the 20th of May, the plotters had one of their earliest meetings at the Duck and Drake, a pub in the Strand. When Winter confirmed the Spanish wouldn't get involved, it only strengthened Catesby's resolve that the only way forward was to blow up Parliament and the King. When Catesby was visited in May by a friend, Thomas Percy, the cousin of the Earl of Northumberland, Percy revealed how infuriated he was by the inaction of Catholics in England. Assured of his friend's leanings, Catesby confided the plot to him and Percy joined the plotters. In late May or early July, using his position as a gentleman pensioner and estate officer for the Earl of Northumberland, Percy was able to rent a small house that belonged to John Winyard, keeper of the King's wardrobe near the Lord's Chamber in the Houses of Parliament. As he had been away for so many years, Guy was an unknown face and he was placed as a caretaker and servant of Percy, known by the pseudonym John Johnson. This is where the two sources for what happened differ slightly. Winter's account states that the plotters planned to dig a tunnel from the cellar of this house to the Parliament buildings. Fawkes' account never mentioned the tunnel, although by his fifth interrogation, he did admit to the tunnel, although he was unable to locate it. It's possible the tunnel story was even a fabrication by the government. But if the tunnel really did exist, the conspirators were busy tunnelling by December 1604. Catesby had a property in Lambeth where gunpowder and mining gear could be stored and another man was brought in to help look after this and help move the equipment, Robert Keyes. Their operation was halted only by an outbreak of plague in the city and the group of plotters separated into the countryside until it was safe to return to London around September. They still had to wait, however, as Scottish commissioners brought in to discuss the proposed union between England and Scotland used the lodgings Percy rented as they were so close to Parliament. Obviously, no digging could go on until just before Christmas, but by Christmas Eve, they had apparently managed to get to the walls of Parliament. Work paused again until February 1605, but this was when the plotters decided to row all of the gunpowder up the Thames from Catesby's house in Lambeth to Percy's lodgings. They had decided to put all their eggs, or gunpowder, in one basket. A few more weeks passed, but progress was slow going through the foundations, so three more people were brought in. Christopher Wright, Robert Winter, brother of Thomas, and John Grant. During one day of tunnelling, however, they heard a rushing noise over their heads. Fearing they were about to be discovered, Guy, as the unknown face amongst them, was sent out to investigate. Fawkes returned with good news that would change the path their plan would take. Underneath Parliament at that time were several undercrofts that merchants using the Thames stored their goods in. One of these merchant tenants had recently died and his widow was clearing out his undercroft, which just happened to be above the plotter's tunnel. In another stroke of good luck, they then found out it belonged to John Winyard, the landlord of Percy's lodgings, and they arranged to rent the undercroft from him. The gunpowder was moved in, 20 barrels at first, according to Guy's version of events, 
followed by another 16 on the 20th of July. But on the 28th of July, another outbreak of plague meant Parliament was sent away until a date that would become famous, the 5th of November. But Fawkes wasn't actually in England at this point. At Easter, he had travelled abroad once more and he would remain there until August 1605. While in the Low Countries, he met with Hugh Owens, a Welsh spy who had fled abroad after being involved in a plot against Elizabeth I, and who had already met with both Thomas Winters and Fawkes and brought them together. While he was in Brussels, Guy updated Owens with how the plot was coming along, so that he could try and drum up support for them within Europe. But back in England, the group of conspirators grew once again as Catesby needed extra financial backing as he was running out of his own money. These three men were all wealthy and were Ambrose Rockwood, Sir Everard Digby and Robert's cousin, Francis Tresham. Tresham would prove to be a bad choice. While all three men were horrified at the idea of blowing up many of their friends and colleagues in Parliament, Rockwood and Digby were apparently brought around to the idea, but Tresham proved harder to convince. He kept his vow of silence, but also offered Catesby large amounts of money to not blow everyone up. More gunpowder was brought into the undercroft they had rented, as the plotters feared some of it might have become damp. Later assessments of the plot would suggest this damp gunpowder meant the explosion wouldn't have been much to write home about, but in fact the sheer amount would have had the effect wanted. Guy, as an experienced soldier, would have known this and would have known exactly what was needed despite the damp supplies. Firewood was brought in to cover up some of the gunpowder. Importantly, Fawkes' role for the 5th of November was finalised. He was to light the fuse and then escape across the Thames, making his way to Europe. He would then visit the Catholic powers of Spain and Italy to explain why he had committed regicide, something that was considered a horrific sin, but also one that could be forgiven in the light of regaining the Catholic faith in England. The plotters met in October in Whitewebs in Enfield Chase, the home of a Catholic noblewoman called Anne Vaux. She was also a cousin of both Francis Tresham and Robert Catesby. It was here they received news that Prince Henry would be with his father at the opening of Parliament, and while Catesby suggested they immediately grab the heir apparent, no one actually moved on this in any way it was finalised they would instead aim for the eldest daughter of James I, Princess Elizabeth. Catesby planned to invite a group of friendly Catholic gentry to meet at his home at Ashby St. Ledger's on the 5th of November. From there, they would seize the princess and later place her on the throne. The fact that none of them were well born enough to be regent for her seems not to have been resolved and it was hinted by both Fawkes and Winters that they were waiting to see which Catholic noblemen might have survived. But then an anonymous letter was sent to William Parker, 4th Baron Monteagle, and one of those due to sit in Parliament. He was also Catholic. While the sender of this letter has never been proven, it's highly suspected it was Anne Vaux, sending the letter through her cousin Francis Tresham. The letter warned Monteagle to stay away, suggesting he retire to the country as Parliament would receive a terrible blow. Not surprisingly, Monteagle took the letter to the King's court to show him, and word got back to the plotters through one of Monteagle's servants. Winter panicked and tried to convince Catesby to call the whole thing off. However, Robert was too far in to stop now, and instead, he sent Guy to check if their store of gunpowder had been discovered. Never questioning the move, Fawkes agreed and went to check the undercroft willingly. Nothing had been disturbed, and it was decided they would continue with their plans. 
The 3rd of November was the final time they could all turn back, when the plotters met with Thomas Percy who had come down from the north. He stated they should go ahead with it all, and sent, via Robert Keyes, a watch to Guy, so he would know what time it was. On the 4th of November, Fawkes went to check the Undercroft one last time. However, he was surprised there by the Earl of Suffolk, Thomas Howard, who had decided to inspect the whole of the Chambers of Parliament, including underneath. A large pile of firewood was hiding the gunpowder, and when they asked Guy whose fuel it was, he simply responded that it belonged to his master, Thomas Percy. This seemed to be accepted by all, although Monteagle would declare on returning to court that he was surprised at Percy renting property in Westminster, apparently also mentioning he was a Catholic. This was enough to make King James, quite rightly, more than a little jumpy, and he ordered that a second inspection be made that evening, under the guise of looking for some stuffs that had gone missing from the royal stores. This time, he asked a gentleman of the Privy Chamber to go, by the name of Sir Thomas Nivet. They went into the Undercroft at around midnight and bumped into Fawkes, who was emerging from the room, armed with a slow match in his watch, fully dressed and wearing boots. Thinking it was odd anyone should be stomping about at that hour dressed to go out, Nivet had him arrested on the spot and ordered the firewood be pulled down. The 36 barrels of gunpowder, nearly a ton, were revealed, and the jig was up. The plot had been discovered. There was enough gunpowder that had the conspirators been successful in their terrorism, it would have wiped out not only the entirety of the Parliament buildings and all those within, but it would have rained parts of buildings on the surrounding population and likely would have started several fires. The death toll would easily have been in the thousands and would have started a religious war in England. Fawkes would now prove his steadfastness as he faced the first of his interrogations by the King's Privy Council with James present. He was hit with question after question but refused to name any of his co-conspirators, except for Thomas Percy, who was already suspected of several crimes. When asked why he had travelled to Flanders, he mockingly replied, to see the country and pass away the time. When asked why he was in possession of so much gunpowder, he did answer candidly, saying he had planned to blow both James I and his Scottish countrymen back to their native mountains. He gave his name as John Johnson from Netherdale in Yorkshire, giving his father's name as Thomas and his mother as Edith Jackson. James I was impressed with Guy's silence on giving up the names of the other plotters and he was admiring of Fawkes, remarking that he had a Roman resolution. However, this admiration did not prevent the king from ordering Guy be tortured on the 6th of November to find out the extent of the plot, although he did advise it should start off lightly, only increasing if Guy continued not to talk. By the 7th, Guy finally gave up his real name, but only because the interrogators finally got around to searching his pockets, where they found a letter addressed to Mr. Fawkes. He also told them there were five people involved in the plot. On the 8th of November, he gave up their names, and by the 9th, he revealed the whole plot, including the part about taking Princess Elizabeth. Although it is unclear what torture was used on Guy, it was enough to make him physically weakened, as evidenced by the shaky and faint signature on his confession. However, unbeknownst to Guy, many of his fellow plotters were already dead. Remembering that news took a long time to travel in the 17th century, Catesby and Winter had travelled to his home in the Midlands to meet with the men they had asked to be there, telling them the king was dead. 
after receiving a cold welcome from family, friends and villagers alike, by the 7th of November, Robert Catesby was a wanted man. Eventually, on the evening of the 7th, they reached Holbeach House and spread out their damp gunpowder in front of the fire to dry. A spark must have leapt out, for the gunpowder was ignited and the house was soon engulfed in flames. Some of the plotters died and some were injured. Catesby vowed he would not be taken prisoner and that he would give his life for his faith. At around 11am on the 8th of November, the Sheriff of Worcester arrived with 200 men and they surrounded the manor house. Catesby and Percy were both killed and the others taken prisoner. Those who survived were taken to the Tower of London with forks to await their fate. The trial of the gunpowder plotters finally took place on the 27th of January 1606. Guy and seven of his co-conspirators were brought by barge from the tower to the Star Chamber in the Palace of Westminster before being taken to Westminster Hall and displayed on a specially built scaffold. The charges against them were read out and the jury found all eight of the defendants guilty. The sentence was for all of them to be hanged, drawn and quartered, the most horrendous execution allowed at the time and one which was designed to leave them with no honour. Four of the plotters were executed on the 30th of January. On the 31st of January, it was the turn of Guy and the three remaining conspirators. Fawkes was made to go last, having to watch through the suffering of his fellow prisoners while contemplating his own. When he stood on the scaffold, he asked forgiveness of the king and state, something that was standard script, but added also that he could not give up his crosses and idol ceremonies, meaning Catholic practices. Onlookers noted that Guy was very weak, probably from his torture, and had to be helped up the ladder by the hangman. Whether a stroke of luck or purposely planned, Fawkes managed to avoid the agony of what was to come by breaking his neck as he was hanged. His lifeless body was then quartered. On the 5th of November later that year, James I declared it a day of thanksgiving and citizens were encouraged to light bonfires to celebrate the survival of their king and parliament. Ever since, bonfires have been connected with the 5th of November in Britain along with the later edition in the 1650s of those gunpowder-filled colourful explosions, fireworks. During the 17th century, it was also traditional to burn an effigy of the Pope on bonfires, but by the 18th century, it had become an effigy of Guy Fawkes. While he was not the leader of the conspiracy, Fawkes was the man who had been captured, the face of the plot, and the one who took the bulk of the blame, as many of the others died before reaching trial. Guy Fawkes became a scapegoat for the others that could not be tried for their crimes, and his name would forever be etched with that of the 5th of November. During the time of Charles I, Charles II and James II, an increasingly Puritan population clung ever more to the commemoration of the 5th of November. It also became a day of challenging authority, and the evening before, on the 4th, became known as Mischief Night, a night for youths to push against the constraints of society's rules. In modern times, Guy's effigy has even been joined by the hated figures of the day, suffragettes, the Kaiser, and even Margaret Thatcher. The term Guy in the 19th century came to mean an oddly dressed person, and in modern parlance, it now refers to a male or a group of people of any gender, as in, hi guys. In modern media, such as films and graphic novels, Guy Fawkes has come to represent postmodern anarchism, a symbol of freedom fighting against an authoritative regime. For some, Guy Fawkes is a terrorist, for others, a freedom fighter, and for others still, merely a political rebel. Fawkes has been described as 
the last man to enter Parliament with honest intentions. He was certainly prepared to die for his principles and his faith, but he was also willing to kill innocent people to create the sort of country he and his plotters thought it should be. No matter who Guy really was, he will always be remembered by this small rhyme, often spoken by children at this time of year. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. Gunpowder, treason and plot. I can see of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.